American Psycho, a film with many twists and turns which, once it was released, became an instant classic. But today I found out some pretty interesting facts about how the movie was written and what they did to ensure that audiences were always on the edge of their seats, wondering, is he the killer or not? Hello! Welcome to Brain Spill, the laziest show on the internet. My name is Tank, and the plot of American Psycho is, well, a lot more complicated than first meets the eye. And you know what, it should be obvious with a video like this, but I'm going to make this crystal clear right now. Spoilers ahead. Yep, if you've never seen this film before, then I implore you to maybe come back once you've watched it. But do come back. But please come back. And you know what, if you carry on watching and get upset that I spoil a movie that's over 20 years old, then you've only got yourself to blame. Like I said, this film has become a cult classic. This thriller was released in the year 2000, with a film set in the 80s following the actions of Patrick Bateman, a New York stockbroker turned killer. Or so it seems. Since its release, it's had a fairly positive review of a 7.6 on IMDb, 70% on Rotten Tomatoes, and a 64% aggregate rating on Metacritic. The film has been analysed to death for the hidden meanings and the true intentions behind the characters. That's not really what we're here to talk about today, and if you want that sort of information, there's 101 different film critics videos online that will surely go into that sort of detail if that's what you're looking for. No, what we're really looking at here today is the creative decisions that were made behind the scenes to make this movie as compelling and as engaging as possible. The film is fairly straightforward in its theme and setting, where the main protagonist plays this double life, one of which is that, by night, they are the killer. But by the third act in the movie, where it is revealed that Bateman had never actually committed any of the vicious murders depicted in the movie, this turning out instead to be an illusionary fantasy. The question is posed, was this real? Did Bateman actually follow through with these murders? This very key piece of information is important because as soon as you find this out, it gets the audience's thinking about the psychopathic tendencies and how that may have clouded his judgment from everything that's happened before in the movie. How can someone like this be relied upon? This is how a cult classic is born. Not just a film that you can watch once and then forget about it, it poses a bigger question and requires you to re-watch the film to get a better understanding not only to what you think they're trying to say, but also for your own belief and understanding as to whatever decision you come to after pulling together all of the clues and hints throughout the movie. This certainly kept audiences wary, as it would seem like in one minute he was very particular and careful and in the next minute was guilty as sin. This was not displayed any better than in the famous scene where Detective Kimball has a meeting with Bateman in his office. If you had a critical eye on the detective, you would have seen some very suspicious behaviour on the murder of Paul Allen, given the way he would interact with Bateman. So, if you're watching this scene and believe that you think the detective knows he's a murderer, he would be pressing the hard asking questions, or, if you think that he's innocent, he might be a little bit more laid back about the whole thing. This is why many people found this scene quite jarring when they first watched it, because they couldn't quite pin down what the inspector was thinking, and there was very good reason for this, because it was filmed in a very particular way. They actually decided to film this scene three different times, and Willem Dafoe, who played Detective Donald Kimball, would act in three different ways when they filmed this scene all three different times. So, in the first scene they did, they would act like Bateman knew that he'd killed Paul Allen. In the second take, he would act like he wasn't sure whether he killed Allen. And in the third take, he was acting in such a way where his character wasn't aware of the fact that he'd killed Allen. So, the reality was that they had three different takes of the same scene, except the detective was acting differently in every single one. Then, all they did was they decided to get the editing board out, cut those films up, and then splice them together into a single scene, which is the one we see in the film. So, what you're actually seeing is three separate takes, all mixed into one. And what's crazy about this is when you find that out, this scene actually makes a lot more sense. Kinda. 
You can see that his posture, his eyesight, his smile, all change shot for shot, which makes so much more sense and really for someone viewing this for the first time, they would be completely thrown off as to what they think the detective is doing, or is trying to achieve as a result of this meeting. And of course it worked to great effect. The best thing you can do for something like this is to try and subvert expectation. And if you give your audiences every eventuality, they aren't gonna know what to think. Even the framing at the end of the scene is all intentional to try and give as much suspense as possible and to keep audiences guessing as to what they think is going to happen next, which is important for a film quite like this. Of course, the movie was based on the 1991 novel of the same name. With the rights to the book, they wanted to try and keep it as close to the original version as closely as possible, to even carry across the same sarcasm and insanity of Bateman. An insanity which would murky the water over what actually happened and how others would perceive him in the movie, and even for himself on self-reflection. For a particularly brutal scene, it is often played off as quite comedic and downplays the true gravity of what's happening, muddying the waters on what the audience should be thinking at this particular time. Many, many sneaky things are at play here. You know, aside from the serial killer and whatnot. The film being set in the glitz and the glamour of the 80s Wall Street does give you a taste of the high life, and it kind of draws comparison to the fact that there's a murderer on the streets. Which again, it's even just these very small details which tries to take the audience's attention away from what's truly happening here. You know, someone that's living the high life, would they have a reason or a need to go out and kill people? I mean, someone from Wall Street you might think yes, but you know, with the glitz and the glamour of this life, it kind of drags away from the fact that someone's living a double life. I mean, you see a man who has just stabbed a homeless man to death, but then goes to a suave, well-dressed and groomed man who has a good paying job and lives in a fancy high-rise apartment. I mean, oh, you can let a guy off for a few murders here or there. You know, aside from that fact, he seems like a lovely guy. Of course, a great director goes perfectly hand in hand with a great actor. Christian Bale plays the main character in the film. Bateman as a character is very well written and there was a spectacular performance carrying out this literal psycho, getting hung up on even the smallest details, such as the use of a font on a business card, which seemingly gets his back up, despite everything else that happens in the film. So again, it's all of these things which add together, which tries to build a picture. A very confusing picture, but a picture nonetheless, making the audiences think what's going to happen next. So yeah, I don't know, I just thought it was an interesting look at a movie. I mean, it's not quite the normal videos I do, but just taking into account the themes, the writing, the characters, all of these little things are all there for a purpose, to try and keep audiences guessing as to what's going to happen next. If you liked the video, be sure to like and subscribe. If you want to be notified as soon as I upload my next video, be sure to hit the bell button. And if you've got any ideas for what topics you'd like me to discuss next, let me know down in the comments below. As always, sources used in the video will be in the description. Um, right, well, normally I write something here as a final comment on whatever topic I'm talking about. However, a past tank obviously forgot to write an ending because it just says template. Yeah, well. Your boy's clearly lost his mind and he's going absolutely insane, almost psycho, so I guess I'll just see you guys in the next video. Fantastic.